definitely a problem. Okay, so um, so so just kind of talking about how close reading figures into this college and career readiness, this is what the research says, that it's the close reading of complex texts that leads to college and career readiness. So that's why everybody got all excited about close reading in the first place. In other words, it just wasn't having kids read difficult material, but what they actually did with it. So what is close reading? And um, so here's a little definition for you. And if you can just kind of take a look at that for a couple seconds and think about um, uh, the words that kind of jump out at you, like what do you want your kids to do as as close readers? So I'll give you just just a few seconds to kind of glance through that, and then I'll hit some of the highlights for you. All right, you probably had a chance um, to read through this. So possibly some words that jumped out at you. Somebody went on with that annotation thing again, and now I can't get this to, oh, okay. Um, to read thoroughly and methodically, um, to go back to text and actually reread it, um, to zero in on the text itself, um, to focus on individual words and sentences, and the development of ideas, and then, the idea with close reading is you're pulling the text apart so much that in the end, you really want to help kids pull it, put it back together to really look at those big ideas. So I'd like you to keep some of these things in the back of your mind and have these sort of be the playlist. And as we go through really what the program components are, think about how these um, aspects fit into it. So that's kind of the close reading piece. And I would say that the second part of the problem is that kids really need access to good small group instruction and um, for a couple of reasons. First of all, for sort of the social, the social emotional needs, and second of all, the academic needs. So, so certainly we have some students that we know are just probably not going to participate a lot um, in a whole class conversation. So getting them into a small group where it seems lower risk um, they're more willing to participate. Um, this also leads to sort of more opportunities for student interaction with, with, with everybody involved. And it also provides better opportunity for the teacher to monitor and hold kids accountable. Because you know, when you're working with a whole class, some kids know just when to get like real busy with the Velcro on their sneakers or something. And so they sort of disappear right in front of us. But in a small group, there's no place to hide. Um, academically, um, small group instruction provide, provides the opportunity for good differentiation. But um, sort of a thought that's new about differentiation, um, and we certainly do not want kids to be reading at their frustration level. However, um, kind of a, you know, I guess a newer thought now is that um, try to vary the instructional scaffolding, um, you know, perhaps more than the text. because. Um, sometimes I think we're so good at, at really slotting kids into um, sort of a very scientific level that kids end up kind of spinning their wheels instead of um, just really making the progress that's as quick as they could. So if we vary the scaffolding but still give kids the opportunity for the challenge, we will be, I think, um, steps ahead there. Um, and, you know, oftentimes teachers tell me, you know, they can't find quality materials. They don't have the time to locate these materials. So that was also um, sort of the basis of trying to develop this program. So I would say that we can achieve these goals of close reading through a program for small group instruction that builds independence, deeper thinking, and skill. So I was really trying to develop um, those three components through the use of close reading in small books. And then, um, so, so that really is what close reading links is all about. 
Um, and so now the rest of this is really just talking about how this program really fits into sort of those uh, research-based constructs there. That this is a teacher and student friendly program that links essential features of close reading to small group instruction. So that's what we'll be, we'll be talking about for the rest of, of our time together. So these practices really form the foundation of close reading links. So the use of short complex text, independent close reading, text dependent questions, comprehension skill instruction, standards, depth of knowledge, conversation, text to text connections, um, and uh, formative assessment. So these will be the pieces that I will talk about. And so you will now see how each of these um, is uh, um, an integral part of close reading links. So first of all, short complex text, there are six student books per grade. Each one has just 24 pages, so in fact they are short text, um, three that are fiction, uh, literary kinds of text, three that are informational. Um, and um, so there's different kinds of text that are always included. Um, I really wanted um, lots of classic children's literature because I think that sometimes our uh, regular curriculum doesn't maybe include enough of that. So in, um, at each grade level, three, four, and five, there's classic children's literature, there's classic poetry, and there is folklore. So good opportunities at all those grade levels to really deal with um, you know, great fiction um, of just all different kinds. Um, for informational text, um, lots of text with an expository format. Um, but other genre too, di uh, diaries, biographies, primary sources. Um, so I tried to really kind of um, consider other things, not just things that look like um, sort of in, um, an encyclopedia article with main ideas and details. Um, also um, sort of different topics represented. So lots of things in history and science. Teachers tell me that they like the opportunities for application even to STEM. Um, and um, to different cultures. So I tried to be diverse. I tried to give kids kind of the opportunity to explore um, different areas that would be interesting to them. So the book format, and, um, and, and so, so the thing that you're gonna find is there's great consistency in the books at all grade levels and all kinds of books. So every book is divided into three parts. And so for example, in the diary book, you can see that there's three, um, three diaries that are represented there, and you can see the names of the girls um, whose diaries they are. The thing that I want to point out about this is that the way I put the informational books together is all of these came from capstone books. So, for example, capstone has a whole book about Sally Hester, a whole book about Carrie Berry, and a whole book about Charlotte Fortin. And what I did is I took excerpts from these books. So a thought for all of you would be that if these work for you, you could go and get the other books that these came from because you'll see that the instructional process is one that you can easily replicate yourself. So, um, so anyway, that's just kind of a thought for down the road. Um, I, I just am going to point out just a few books um, that are really favorites of students. I'd like to talk about all of them, but I don't really think I have time for that. Um, at the third grade level, kids love the Extraordinary Animals book. Um, take a look at that. Do you know what that is? That is the Komodo dragon. Um, there's also in this book an excerpt about the platypus and this guy right here, and that's a real animal. It may You may not um, have ever seen one, probably not, but that is called the okapi. So um, anyway, it gives kids a chance um, to explore those, and I think all kids like animals that are, um, you know, that are a bit extraordinary. Um, People from long ago, and this is the book, and kids are like, oh yeah, well there's George Washington and Abraham Lincoln, but they're not so sure about this person. Well, that is Pocahontas. So, um, so anyway, um, kids find that pretty interesting. At the fourth grade level, some favorites characters from long ago. Um, and in this book, Dr. Doolittle, The Five Little Peppers, remember those um, stories from you know way back when, um, and Black Beauty. So again, these are just individual chapters, but they're sort of standalone pieces 
so they are easy for fourth graders. Diaries from long ago, um, kids really love this. I think just the idea that they're sort of reading somebody's, you know, personal experiences. So um, there's a girl traveling west in a covered wagon, um, a girl living in the South during the Civil War, and an African-American girl in Boston during the Civil War also. And that has to do with sort of a slave capture um, which is which kids sort of find interesting. Um, grade five, um, one of the um, the best finds I think uh, that that I was able to sort of access for this is primary sources um, from American history, and so this book has um, sections on U.S. independence, slavery in the United States, and westward expansion. But what I really love about the way these primary source books are sort of organized is if you can see on your screen the part that is in, it's actually a red font there. So they always, um, so these books highlight um, the primary source material. And so what is so great about this is these quotes are embedded in a context and that makes the primary source manageable, whereas if they were to read like the whole like Declaration of Independence or um, the Gettysburg Address, that would be really complex. But taking quotes from these and then embedding them in other contexts, um, then it's doable. Um, and I've already used some of this material with, with, with kids. And yes, it's complex, but they're so proud of themselves when they actually, um, you know, can get through it and make meaning. And it's a great thing in that way. Um, uh, there's always, like I said, there's always a poetry book. In fifth grade, um, the topic um, is themes through poetry. And so um, this is just an excerpt that I just put up here now from, um, the Village Blacksmith, and, um, you know, the author there being uh, William Wadsworth Longfellow. So, um, you know, kids have a chance to explore great poets, great, um, great themes, um, and that is true at, at um, all the other grade levels, too. Just a, a, a quick update, the, um, the fourth grade poetry book has, um, is all poems that have to do with nature. And um, the third grade book is sort of, it's a much lighter fare. It's, um, it's sort of childhood fun, but for example, there's a lot of poems there by uh, Robert Louis Stevenson. So um, that just sort of gives you an idea um, of the kinds of topics um, that are covered there. And then the last one, um, grade five, um, who doesn't, you know, sort of want to find out more about going fast at an amusement park? Um, so the topic is, the general topic is going fast, and that's the first excerpt, and then running, jumping, and throwing, bikes and trains. Um, so, um, so that, um, you know, kind of, um, you know, has sort of a physics application and sort of that aspect of science. So, um, anyway, kids really, of course, are intrigued by, you know, well, how do those things go so fast, and how does that water slide work? So. Um, so anyway, um, those are just some, some possibilities there. So before I, I go on to anything else, um, any questions about the books or anything else so far? We have one question about pricing, which I can just answer in the comments. Um, but other than that, I don't, we don't have any right now. Sure. Okay, well, and I can just say that on my end that people have been very pleased with the price. Um, it's pretty manageable, and I believe that the teacher's guide comes with that. Is that right? So they get a classroom set and the, the teacher's guide? Yes. Um, yes, when you order the whole set with the six packs. Yeah. Yes, so okay, single, all right. Single books are seven ninety five, dollars um, and then packages start at about uh, forty seven seventy dollars is just the single titles for each grade. Yeah, fifty-seven, fifty-eight gives you six copies of each student's book plus the teacher's guide. Yeah, and as I'll explain in just a minute, that's a whole lot of instruction that you're getting for that price. So, so I mean, the districts that I've presented this um, to so far have been actually pretty, pretty pleased with that. Okay, so shall I just go on? Yep. Okay. So, all right. So now, in terms of teaching the book. Um, it, and actually, that was a great segue to this, because each part of the book will be taught over several days. So I'm going to show you kind of what that means. 
there's always a component for like um, independent close reading. So that's always the first part. Then going back to that text for deeper thinking with text dependent questions and then um, skill introduction reinforcement or application or formative assessment, whatever we want to call it there. So those are always the three dimensions, um, regardless of grade, regardless of, 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 of book. So the way that I kind of calculate this, you really get two to three weeks of instruction per book, and here's how. So first of all, there's a launching lesson for the whole unit, and all these lessons are all written out for you, I'll show you. But you've got material in the student book, you've got material in the teacher's guide. Then there are three lessons um, for each part of, the, of um, the book, and that's about nine days if you, um, even if each lesson only takes you one day. And actually, the independent close reading in some cases is going to take more than a day. So, for example, with that primary source material, that's pretty slow going. So don't equate, like, uh, one lesson per day because it may actually turn out to be more than that. Um, and then there's a text-to-text -text lesson at the end. So right there, if you've got nine, you've got, you've got 11, even if things, everything only takes you one day. And like I said, um, it, it could conceivably be much more. Um, there's an extensive teacher's guide for every grade level um, specific to each grade. Um, every lesson is clearly, is clearly defined for you so you know exactly what the process is. There's also in the teacher's guide, there's four mini lessons for developing independent close reading skills. And one of the things that I want to point out is some of the generic materials like this can be used, you know, not just with this program, but with anything else that you want to teach too. And I'll be talking about what those lessons are in just a bit. Um, there's lots of class, um, you know, classroom ready um, pages that you can, you know, just reproduce. There's rubrics. Uh, there's checklists, there's, you know, there's, there's a variety of different kinds of things there. There's also suggestions for differentiation, and I'll show you those in just a second, but I do want to point out, you know, that this is just, just a starting point, um, and that anything that you see fit to do is, is fine as well. So um, this is just um, sort of a page from the teacher's guide that is part of this. So um, for each component, so in other words, for the launching lesson, for the independent close reading, for the text-dependent question, I've, um, I've provided um, uh, uh, different um, possibilities for, um, for, for kids that are not just working um, as sort of grade level learners. So um, the lessons themselves, I would say, are designed for kids that are, um, you know, probably at grade level, approaching grade level, maybe a little bit beyond grade level. But I've also now provided um, some uh, differentiation strategies for above grade level kids, for below grade level kids, and also for English learners. So, um, so it gives you, um, and you can even see on the screen here, this is the, um, just the modifications for the launching lesson. And they're just simple techniques, but, uh, but things that you could do to conceivably, um, you know, change it up for the kids that needed something other than the way the lesson was um, described in the lesson itself. Um, there's always a launching lesson, and, and that is for the entire book. So first of all, just really talking about the unit as a whole, what the topic is, and then introducing the book in pretty much the way you would always do it, like looking for um, clues to meaning on the cover. Um, I always have kids kind of thumb through and look for um, uh, just a picture that might interest them. We don't do a picture walk, but just, you know, something that kind of um, gets them curious. Um, sometimes I also have kids uh, find, and I'll show you in a minute, the pause and think boxes, and we talk about how those are really going to be used. Then um, the first day is sort of reading and discussing the introduction. And, um, you know, this can be done in any number of different ways, and I've, again, provided some suggestions here. And then there's the option also um, of reading for the gist. Um, and I do want to talk just a little bit about this whole gist thing, because don't confuse reading for the gist with close reading. Um, I mean, this is just kind of a quick survey of text. I would never have kids read one of these whole books um, as kind of a gist read, but um, but you could, for example, with um, the diary book that I showed you before, maybe they would just read 
the diary of Sally Hester. And, and if you want to just take the temperature very quickly of kind of where kids are in their comprehension, um, having them just do a quick read and then what did they get out of it is, is, a, is a place um, to begin. So um, in the model lessons that I do, I actually haven't been doing that because I don't usually have that much time. Um, going into classrooms, but, uh, but if it's your classroom, of course, it, it, could, all, it could all be different. Um, so that's really where I see this um, reading for the gist fitting in. Um, there's, again, there's three lessons for each part of the text, and this is really what makes up the bulk of the teacher's guide. So, um, so getting to know um, characters from classic children's literature, the, uh, in, but, but, it's, but this is the way it's going to look for every, for every book. So the first lesson, as you see there, is for independent close reading. The second one is for text-dependent questions, and those are all written out for you, um, along with a strategy for, um, for uh, sort of teaching those questions. And then um, there's a skill lesson. So, um, so that's the format for every single one. Um, and the idea is, you know, again, with complex text, um, there should be things to go back for, and so we've kind of made that happen. So I want to talk now about the independent close reading because um, that's really that's really the first place that you'll that you'll really dive into the content. So um, so this is the way the pages look, and I was referencing before those pause and think boxes, and you can see them right there. So um, so tune in here to kind of the idea that the text is chunked. Um, so that um, kids are stopping periodically to think about the words they need to clarify and the details that the author is providing right there. So that's the way um, that's the way all these pages are are set up. And so so the reason I believe that this really leads to independence is. Um, that we're leading with the opportunity for kids to make meaning on their own before we jump in with text-dependent questions. So when they come to that pause and think box, I typically say, okay, so who wants to start? Who's got a word? Who's got a detail? And the kids just kind of jump in, and then they very uh, sort of happily go back to the text and they cite the sentence or whatever. So um, so they really are, are staying... Um, uh, you know, tuned into what we're doing. Nobody's um, getting lost. So just um, here would be an example of what I would want them to do. So this is just the, um, the first paragraph that you actually saw on the previous page. So just take a quick look at that and think about, if you would, um, what words, um, you know, think of it, this is actually a fourth grade book, but you could think about um, the kids, you know, the kids in your class, what words would they maybe need to clarify? What details would you want them to be noticing there? Just take a, a, a quick look at that and we'll, we'll get back to it. Okay, I think I'm going to go on here. Um, so um, I, I think we probably won't like unmute this to do it, but but you know my guess is that words that you might have come up with were grazing, um, spry. Actually, kids mentioned that one the other day, I'll, and the grazing one too, cholera, um, and that's a word um, that usually requires some pronunciation help as well as some. Um, just definitional work. Um, seek their fortune. So, you know, keep in mind here, it's not necessarily going to be a single word. It might be a phrase. It might be um, sort of a figurative phrase. So um, think about that. Um, details to notice the year. Um, the, mother, the family is now healthy and the mother is feeling better. I mean, that kind of plays into it. Um, two people have died. Heading, uh, the family is heading west to seek their fortune, and the planes are, are, I mean, so this is kind of a happy trip in that, um, that the planes are pretty at this time of year. So, um, so those are the pieces that we want kids to get out of, of that, um, of that short section there. Um, and the benefits to kids, I think, um, first of all, nobody gets lost. Um, and, and sometimes I think, 
um, that when we check on comprehension, um, you know, and, and we find that kids don't understand, I, I think sometimes that if we had checked after the first paragraph, we would have found out that they've actually been lost for quite a long, you know, for quite a long time. So by really checking in with kids and showing them that good reading is sort of slowing our process down, not just reading fast to get through it. Um, you know, nobody gets lost. We can really, um, we can uh, monitor our thinking and really, you know, make sure that everybody's thinking is, is on track. The other thing that this really provides for, and we'll talk about this throughout, is that oral response comes first. So, um, so there will be opportunities to write, but giving kids the chance to talk about their thinking before writing about it uh, really um, builds both confidence and competence. So um, thinking, of, thinking about that. And then there is the chance to have kids annotate. So after they have finished a whole section, like for example, um, the whole part that would be on Sally Hester, um, what are the key words? Not necessarily the hard words, but what are the words you really need in order to talk about that text? Just, just that, you know, five, six words. Um, and then can you summarize it? And, and more so, can you use those key words in order uh, to create that summary? Um, you know, so what are the central ideas there? And maybe there's more than one. So, you know, make sure that kids are, are, are um, thinking about all the possibilities. And then what authors, crafts, and text features uh, sort of added to the message? So you can see here um, on the right side of the screen, that page is actually inside the front cover of all the student books. So kids can just jot their ideas on sticky notes and just place them there. And then, of course, that becomes an opportunity for a conversation, um, you know, the next time that they meet in their group. Um, there's also in the teacher's guide, there is an annotation worksheet. So if students want to just, you know, write directly on a sheet, um, you can just make copies of that and they can either put their sticky notes there or that they can write directly on it. So, um, so that's really what that's all about. But, you know, back to our point about this is about teaching and not just practice. Um, we certainly have some kids that are not great at identifying the keywords or summarizing or determining the central idea or author's crafts. So um, in order um, to do that, in the teacher's guide, I've provided four explicit lessons um, to, uh, to kind of guide you through each of those processes. So this is what one of the lessons looks like. This is just about the central idea. But again, there's all of um, there's all of the, um, the the four components there, and you can see that for each lesson, I've identified the purpose, the points that are really important to cover, um, the kinds of text that you might want to choose in order to teach this lesson, even if it's not part of this program, and then what the teaching steps are, and then sort of follow up tasks that kids can engage with. So, um, so anyway, um, all the lessons are written out for you, um, and you can um, do these at various times. I, I think my preference would be not to expect kids to um, be able to complete all four of these um, components, the keywords, the summary, central idea, and craft features, but maybe um, sort of do them one at a time and, and then add a second one and then the next one and then the next one. So um, kind of introduce them, um, you know, gradually uh, and, and, and then kids will be, you know, still have plenty of books and plenty of opportunities to apply as they go through the year. So that's kind of, um, what I have to tell you about the structure of the lessons and the independent close reading. Any questions about that um, or anything else that sort of popped into your mind as I've gone through this, um, this much of it? No, no questions right now. No questions. I'm just going to soldier on here. Let's see what we can what we can talk we do about have, next. We do have okay. a comment I okay. want to read to you, though. Is um, uh, okay. I'm watching without sound at a conference. Can't wait to get into this. Thanks for everything. <gasps> okay. For well. All right. So I think that you are actually recording this, so this person can um, 
can access that and hear it too, right? Correct. We will be sending okay. out the recording. All right. Very good. So I'm going to move on to text oh, dependent sorry, questions. We got, oh, we got something We did get one more. Yep. How long right. should a mini lesson be? Oh, good question. I should have put that in the presentation. Um, I always go for 20 minutes because the idea is that in any kind of a literacy block that you will want to work with multiple groups. And so, you know, when you look at your whole literacy block, you have a combination of shared reading, small group instruction, independent reading. So I don't let any of them just like go wild and crazy. It's like I, I kind of, um, I mean, I pace myself. Um, and so I think 20 minutes um, is a good length. And so um, all the lessons that I have modeled in classrooms so far, um, so for the independent close reading would just be 20 minutes. With the text dependent questions, 20 minutes. Now, you can go back to some of these things the next day. I mean, there's no, um, you know, there's no limit um, in terms of a program as far as how much time you spend. So rather than just having a lesson go really long, I would just cut it off and then, um, and then, and then maybe pick it up, um, you know, the next time. Okay, that was a good question. Anything else? No, nope, nothing else right now. Thank you. Okay. All right. Moving on to text dependent questions. So, um, all right. So the, the goal of this, of course, with the text dependent questions was to include all standards and all depths of knowledge. Because we want kids to become used to the kind of rigor that's expected um, when they see assessments, when they're doing um, any kind of standards, you know, connected um, uh, curriculum work now. So at the end of every um, section, so I, I, I'm, I keep using this um, diary book, so that's the one that keeps popping up here. But at the end of each section, so for example, when kids are finished the four or five pages that are about Sally Hester, um, here are the questions that go with that. They're always in the student book and they're also in the teacher book. So, um, so I've tried to sort of designate where they are. So, you know, always think about what's the depth of knowledge and what are the standards. So, for example, um, the question, why is the information in the text box about the Pawnees important to your understanding of this passage? That's going to be a DOK3 question because it really requires kids to use their logic and their strategic thinking. Um, what tone does Sally create in her entry? What words contribute to it? Again, that's going to be a DOK3 question. Is there anything Sally could have explained more thoroughly in her diary? Um, you know, that's a real critical thinking thing. That actually is still just DOK3. But the point of it is that in, in kids' independent close reading, they're basically addressing the, um, uh, that first depth of knowledge. So that's really what they need to construct meaning. And there will also be some DOK2 things that are sort of thrown in there, and there will be more opportunities for DOK elsewhere. So I've really tried to emphasize DOK3 because I think that's the one that slips off um, our teacher radar. And so um, just trying to sort of make that, uh, you know, make those questions more available to teachers and give kids the opportunity to really think about those kinds of, of, of questions. So, for example, and I just sort of um, played this one out a little bit, um, why that information is important. And it, uh, the page that I showed you from that diary, it doesn't have all the information, but basically what it said in that text box was that, um, this little girl's perception of the Pawnees was very different from the sort of the facts of the matter. So an answer that we might be looking for might be something like, you know, the text, the text box lets us know that Sally's point of view about the Pawnees wasn't exactly true, that that sometimes happens with a first person narrator. Sally thought the Pawnees were mean, but they were actually helpful. Now, of course, to really get full credit for that, you would want evidence from the text, but I sort of ran out of screen space. So, but that gives you the idea of, of what you would be going for with something like that. Um, so, so um, you know, again, in, in every book then, there will be three sets of text-dependent questions after each part of that book. So you'll have plenty of opportunity. And um, uh, the way that the uh, teacher's guide um, sort of suggests that you do this is maybe assign um, different um, 
pairs of kids, different questions, that's one way to do it. Um, certainly you could, if you've got a group that's like lower level, you might just pick a couple of the questions that they think, uh, that you think that they would be successful with. But the idea when you go back to that text, or with really any lesson, is you wanna make this more student-centered than teacher-centered if you can. That's a big benefit of um, small group instruction is um, it should be more about kid talk and less about teacher talk. So I do wanna talk now about the, the skill instruction because I think that that's a particularly strong feature of this. So let me explain. Um, this is always the third read. And what I've done in each case is I've picked something about the book that's complex. That in other words, kids might not just already have all this knowledge at their fingertips. So it's based on this, you know, model of gradual release, which I'm sure you, many of you have seen before, where at the beginning of an instructional cycle, the teacher is in charge, and it's kind of the I do and you watch. And then if you do a good job by the end of the cycle, it's reversed. Now you do and I watch. So that's really where kids are hopefully going to be independent. So. As we think about this, um, you know, that's what we want kids to do is to really apply this gradual release. So there's always going to be three lessons. So after the first section of the book, there will be a lesson. Um, the skill lesson there will be with like lots of explaining and modeling and guidance from the teacher. After the second section of the book, there will be less guidance and more student collaboration. And the third, um, part is now the independence with or without an answer frame, and I'm gonna tell you all about that in a minute. But that's really where, again, we're hoping to see that now kids are able to um, operate more by themselves. At every grade level, there are six different skills, so I just put up um, for you what the fourth grade um, set of skills are so that you can, you can see that. Um, we're gonna do a, a little, um, another little exercise with this in just a minute, but so that you can see there's always six things um, and that, that is, is, is a feature of this. Um, I think, uh, um, you know, again, what makes this skill component strong is that there are scaffolds for students. Um, I call this a skill target. You can even see the cute little um, target icon with a pencil, you know, aiming right for the center of it um, at the top of this. And um, so there's a copy of this in the student book. Um, and also there's a copy in the, in the teacher's guide, but essentially this explains how. And that's the piece that kids are always missing. It's sort of like taking the top off your head and having them peer inside and, and, and finding out what a good reader does in order to find the best evidence for any particular skill. So it explains, it, it basically explains how do, you, how do you get the A here? How are you going to be successful? So um, step by step, how do, you, um, how do you answer this question well? And you can see the steps, even though you may not be able to read them, you can see that the steps are, are you know, all um, sort of lined out there for kids to be thinking about. Um, it, you know, again, how to find the very best evidence then also in the student book, um, and this is the last page of the book, um, but in the teacher's guide too, because we don't want kids to be writing in the book, they can use it as a reference point, but um, in the teacher's guide, this will also be present um, for duplicating. And basically this shows how to answer the question to make it clear and specific. So think of who this is gonna help in your class. This is gonna help your English learners who don't really know English, um, you know, English language structures. This is gonna help all those kids who have these great ideas like roaming around in their head, but for the life of them, they just can't get it on paper in a logical way that makes sense. It also points out the kind of elaboration that you need. So not only do you have to answer the question, but you have to provide um, the elaboration and also sort of an extension to thinking. And this of course is what's required on all of the high stakes tests. So if your kids are taking um, an SBAC type test or PARC or even um, a test from your state, if it's not one of those, it probably is based on these new assessments. These are the expectations. Um, I also wanna point out that my book, That's a Great Answer, has got um, 50 targets and 50 um, 
answer frames for all different comprehension skills. So um, if you really like this concept um, and you want to sort of apply it um, to other um, to other skills and other standards, um, that's a place that you can that you can locate that. So that's really the skill piece, and I, I know I'm going through this kind of fast, but I, I do want to finish in the time that we have um, a lot. Um, anybody have a question about the skills? We don't have any new questions right now. Okay, I'm going to go on because our time is just going away from us here. Um, so, um, you know, so, so we also just want to talk about the fact that this incorporates all standards. And so I just want you to kind of know where you're going to be finding these things. Um, the, so we talked about the text-dependent questions and um, they're linked to depth of knowledge, but I also want you to know that there's many questions there that really emphasize standards four, five, and six, craft and structure. I mean, um, that first band is present too and, and the final band, but too often in published materials, um, good, um, deep questions about standards four, five, and six are really not there. And so um, so there's plenty of, of those represented in the text-dependent questions. There's also a text-to-text -text lesson at the end of every book which focuses on standard nine, comparisons between texts. I'm going to show you that in just a bit. Um, but I want you, um, you know, to know that that standard is well represented um, every place. With the skill lessons um, address five or six standards per grade level. Um, sometimes um, the same standard is represented twice, but, um, but, but, but that would be all. So for example, here we are back at that fourth grade list again, but identifying character attitude, that's gonna be standard three. Identifying the moral of the story would be standard two. Identifying figurative language would be four, author's purpose, six, text features, and in this case, it's about a timeline, is going to be five, and genre elements, again, is going to be five. So that's what's present at grade four, um, it, but like I say, every grade level would have, um, would, would have five or six different um, uh, standards represented. So we've talked a little bit about depth of knowledge, but let me kind of try to put this together for you, too. Um, so for independent close reading, that's really going to emphasize DOK 1 and 2 because it's really about evidence and concepts. And honestly, that's all that really that needs to accomplish because if kids can construct meaning in that first go round, then they go back to that text for, for deeper understanding. That's kind of the way close reading works. Um, text dependent questions, like I say, a lot of DOK 3, there will also be some 2. Um, but um, but I, I really did work hard to get lots of good DOK3 questions into that. The skill lessons are primarily DOK2, but with the answer frame, that extension always carries, and that inferential thinking always carries it to DOK3. So the skill lesson itself will be DOK2, but the actual written response will meet the criteria for DOK3. Um, the text-to-text -text lesson, that will always be DOK4 because kids are integrating text from multiple sources. So I think we've pretty much covered the waterfront there, um, and I think that you'll see that the more of these books that you use with your kids, the better they will, um, the more adept they'll really become at, um, at responding to these, to these deeper um, depths of knowledge. Um, I want to talk a little bit about the role of conversation um, because this was quite intentional here. So, you know, um, so, so one of the things that we really want to emphasize is that before writing about their reading, students should have the opportunity to try out their thinking orally because if students can't say it, they'll never be able to what? They'll never be able to write it. And so, um, so that really gives them um, kind of a, 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 you know, a head start. Um, so lots of opportunities for, um, for, uh, for uh, conversation. So the pause and think responses, um, the responses on the annotation worksheet, um, text answers to text dependent questions. I mean, all these are things that we want kids to be able to have the chance to uh, just say out out loud. Um, even the, um, the the sort of interactive work with the skill lessons, 
the responses to the text-to-text -text lessons. I'm going to show you that in a bit, but, um, you know, certainly you can go to a written format for that, but the conversation first will help kids um, to really um, revise and refine their thinking. So let me just quickly here talk about these text-to-text -text lessons. Um, at the end of every book, you can see page 22 out of 24 um, in every book, there will be three or four um, text connection lessons. And the idea is, you know, that kids have to think about multiple texts and responding. So we want them to synthesize information from multiple sources. Um, and the questions are both in the teacher's guide and in the student book. Um, good for discussion and then certainly also could be completed in writing for more GOK4 analysis there. So here were the questions that popped up um, for that diary book. In your view, which girl faced the most sim which girls faced the most similar problems described by their as described by their diary excerpts? Choose two girls and explain your thinking. Um, another one that talks about the challenges, another one that really gets kids to sort of be evaluative and think about what was surprising or concerning. So, um, so those are the kinds of questions, and I think you can say, you know, that there's a reason that um, DOK4 is called extended thinking because kids, because these are really going to be pretty big conversations in, in your group and fairly long um, kinds of writing when students respond more than just the written response for the skill lesson. So um, questions about standards, depth of knowledge, or text-to-text -text questions? Nope, doesn't look like we have any new ones okay. right now. All right, let me just kind of go forward. So the last part to talk about here in terms of the program itself is the formative assessment. And so um, the, the thing that we're um, assessing most directly would be the comprehension skills, um, but also you can certainly assess through students' oral response. Um, you can measure standards. You can measure depth of knowledge. And you can collect data with um, uh, rubrics and checklists, all of which are in this teacher's guide. So um, there's even a checklist for students for depth of knowledge. And again, you know, once you have this teacher's guide, you can apply this to other curriculum materials. Um, certainly, it, it would it would support that too. So you know, did I find the best evidence? Did I complete the skill task by myself? Right, because. Um, in order for a skill to be useful, it has to be independent. Did I make an inference and support it? That's the essence of DOK3. And then did I connect the text well? So, um, so those, are, those are the things that we want kids to consider. And then we've given teachers the same opportunity, but now um, with a little bit more complexity by um, providing a rubric and not, um, just, a, and, um, not just a checklist. So again, DOK1, recognizing and recalling evidence. DOK2, building skills and concepts. Strategic thinking and reasoning for DOK4, and then using extended, or three rather, and then using extended thinking, and that's DOK4. So again, you know, this is not exclusive to this program. This is just what depth of knowledge is all about. So, you know, you can apply this here. I hope you will, but you can also apply it um, to other, to other content too. I've also um, uh, um, given you a rubric for um, all those skill questions and they all have to do with drawing a conclusion and making an inference. Um, so, you know, the three categories that you want to look at there are the inference, the development of the ideas, and the connection to a life lesson. This is again what high stakes assessments are going for. We need to give kids more opportunities um, to learn and to practice through our day-to-day -day instruction so that when they see these kinds of questions on big tests that they're not blindsided by the expectations. Um, I will finish up just very quickly by um, talking about um, finding a place for close reading in your literacy block. Um, you know, I, I'm sure that, you know, among all the people that are participating in, the, in this session today, we have a lot of different kinds of literacy curriculum going on. Uh, readers workshop, core programs, district created curriculum. So this is how I see this sort of integrating with whatever you have. So if you've got a readers workshop program, um, you know, the, the workshop model doesn't typically include small group instruction, but you could add this component with flexible groupings of students um, in need of more attention and comprehension. So, um, 
you know, those groups would probably be pretty flexible. Um, a lot of your work I know is done through conferring, but this would bring together kids with common needs. If you have a core program like Wonders or um, Reading Street or Journeys or, you know, any one of those big programs, they usually do include level readers, but their focus is not on close reading. And most of the time, these books are not considered complex. So you might be able to switch out sometimes and do, um, and, and, you know, do some of these books instead. And bear in mind that all of those level texts uh, usually have some kind of a skill focus, and you could sort through um, the books in this program to see what might um, substitute, you know, pretty equitably for a, a book that you might take out. If you have district-created curriculum, there's often no consistency to small group work. Um, teachers tend to pull resources from a, a bunch of different places. So this would help to really build coherence and quality. And sometimes I, I get concerned when teachers tell me, oh, I got this from Teachers Pay Teachers. I got this from this other source. You know, they may be all fine individually, but they don't necessarily all fit together. And, and we need to show kids how they should be connecting the dots. So that's kind of what that is. Who benefits? Um, I would say all students because the program really teaches close reading. It doesn't just supply close reading worksheets or a workbook. Um, English learners because of the focus on vocabulary. Um, struggling readers, um, all the way I would say from grades three to eight. These books are not um, identified by grade level, I don't believe. So your um, sixth or seventh or eighth graders are not gonna be humiliated. Um, and I think they would find plenty of challenge with some of these topics. and. Um, uh, the complexity, so you know, don't hesitate to use this book, this uh, this program above grade five, and, and even for second graders who are maybe pretty sharp little kids, and you could certainly think about those third grade books. I would hope that it really benefits teachers because um, to get back to our you know sort of initial issue here, you now have high quality small group materials for close reading and really um, thorough, well developed teachers guides. It's not some teachers guides. It's like once you open them up, it's kind of like they're not actually that helpful, but I'm pretty sure that you would find that these, um, that these teacher's guides really, you know, hit the mark. So that's kind of that. Um, any questions about any program component? We don't currently have any questions waiting, um, but if okay. anybody does think of any, um, we are going to send out a follow-up to this webinar and you can feel free to reply to that with your questions too, and we'll get them. Sure. To All right. Well, thank you. And you know, to purchase this, I mean, contact your Capstone sales rep. I'm sure they'd be more than happy to help you out. Um, and you know, uh, just like we were saying, if you have any questions, feel free to contact Capstone, or um, and then um, I would be happy to respond um, um, as well. So, uh, thank you very much for participating in this, and. Um, I hope that if you, you know, do decide to, you know, check out these materials, that they really meet your needs and your expectations. Nancy, we have two questions that came in. Okay. Um, do you do close readings daily? Um, well, this book provides kids with so many opportunities for different kinds of close reading, like it's the independent close reading, it's um, text-dependent questions, and then it's also skills. So, I mean, I would say, um, you know, as often as you can work with a small group every, um, you know, every week. I mean, I, I like the idea of, of working with every group every day, but I know sometimes that's not possible. So, I mean, I think if kids have the opportunity for close reading um, a couple of times a week, um, I think that that's, uh, that's kind of bare bones, but, um, but anything is better than nothing and, you know, this is one of those things where more probably is better because I think it's not, I mean, kids are not gonna regard this as drudgery. I think that they're, they're gonna enjoy the challenge because they're gonna feel successful with it. And our other question is, can we mix lessons with other small group sources or lessons? Oh, absolutely, yeah, that's what I was just saying. So for example, if you have um, the leveled readers that go with lots of core programs, um, yeah, I mean, you, you certainly can. Or um, or even, for example, if you want to use this, 
like a, a, a topic that would um, apply to science or social studies if you want to use it in your content area rather than as part of your literacy block. That's, that's another option. Um, so, yeah, I mean, you know, mix it up. I mean, any way, and, and sometimes you might just want to do a part of a book. So, um, you know, I, I think that there's lots of different ways that you can play with this. And, um, you know, as I always tell teachers, I mean, you know, sometimes I think they feel kind of bad telling me um, that they're not doing things exactly my way. And I tell them, you know what, after I get over my hurt feelings, I, I'm actually really glad that you're making it yours. So, um, and my feelings are not hurt, you know, um, um, at all. So feel free to just, you know, make it yours in whatever way um, seems to work best for you. I mean, every class is a different challenge. So what works this year won't necessarily be exactly what next year's group needs. Um, and the last question is, how can I find my capstone sales rep? And I can take that one if if you want me to, Nancy. Yeah, go for it. <laughs> <laughs> if you go to capstoneclassroom.com, at the bottom there is a find my rep link. And if you click on that, you just put in your zip code and then it'll tell you who your rep is. And I um, know who asks this, so I will also just get in touch with you directly and let you know who it is. Sure. And I would just add um, that I, um, uh, spend quite a bit of time in schools just doing like grade level seminars on on this with with teachers and could model with your kids so if you're interested in professional development you can also let capstone know that um, and um, you know maybe I'll actually see some of you face to face great thank you so much Nancy thanks everybody for joining us today um, have a wonderful day thank you so much all right bye have bye. a good day everybody bye bye